Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Andrew Johnson, Chair of the Public Works and Infrastructure uh, Committee, and I'm going to call to order this regular meeting of the committee on June 9th, and I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Payne. Present. Councilmember Wansley. Present. Councilmember Vita is absent. Councilmember Chugtai. Present. Councilmember Koski. Present. Chair Johnson. Present. There are five members present. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum. With that, the agenda for today's meeting is before us. There are two items on our consent agenda. We also have a public hearing that we'll get to in just a moment, and then a discussion item uh, on Hennepin Avenue street reconstruction, which was carried over from the previous uh, committee meeting. So we'll first go ahead with the consent items. The first is a snow and ice removal from public sidewalk assessment, setting a public hearing for July 28th to consider the assessment charges for snow and ice removal from public sidewalks that remain unpaid. The second item on our consent agenda is the Bicycle Advisory Committee appointments, approving the following appointments for a two-year term beginning June 1st, ending May 31st, 2024, Michael Andrus, C3, Ward 3, and then approving the following council reappointments for two-year terms beginning June 1st and ending May 31st, 2024. Dan Miller for seat one, Georgiana Yantos for seat five, Deanna Newman for seat seven, Aaron Schaefer for seat eight, Elisa Schuffman for seat nine, Natalie Wagner for seat 10, Maya Sheik for seat 11, and Brianna Woodcraft for seat 12. I'll go ahead and move the consent items and ask if there's any discussion from our committee members. And I am not seeing any, so I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Vita is absent. Councilmember Chugtai. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Chair Johnson. Aye. There are five ayes. And that motion carries and those consent items are adopted. I will also mention too, I didn't mention it up at the beginning, but uh, Councilmember Vita is out sick today. So we wish her well and that she feels better uh, quickly and uh, uh, has a, a full recovery. So uh, we will now go on to our public hearing, which is for the stormwater management program and annual report. Uh, before I begin with opening this, I will, uh, turn to Director Anderson Kelleher to ask who will be presenting and doing a presentation today. Welcome, Director. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Today, presenting on this item will be Elizabeth Stout, Principal Professional Engineer in the Surface Water and Sewer Division. Excellent, thank you, Director. Welcome, Ms. Stout. Hello, and thank you for your time this afternoon. Um, I'm Liz Stout with the Public Works Surface Water and Sewers Division, and I'll be speaking to you today about the city's stormwater management program. I wanna provide you with a little bit of history on the underground development of Minneapolis first. As in other older cities, Minneapolis sewers originally carried both sewage from homes as well as stormwater directly to the Mississippi River before the first wastewater treatment plants were built in this area in the 1930s. Since then, Minneapolis has steadily carried out a series of projects to separate sanitary and storm sewer flow and reduce combined sewer overflows, or what we call CSOs. A CSO would occur when a heavy rainstorm led to too much flow in the combined pipe and the combination of stormwater and sewage overflowed into the Mississippi River rather than backing up into people's homes. Today, the city has, a, has nearly completely separated the storm and sanitary sewer system. This is an accomplishment that very, very few cities of our age have been able to accomplish. This has led to an increase in the water quality of the river. In 1928, the USGS did a fish survey between the St. Anthony Falls and Red Wing. At that time, they found two fish within that 50 mile stretch of the river. Um, the water quality improvements in the river in the past 100 years have seen fish populations greatly rebound 
And in fact, we've had a reestablishment of native mussel populations, which is an indicator of river health. The city storm sewer system collects and discharges runoff into receiving waters such as the lakes, creeks, and the Mississippi River. The city is responsible for 556 miles of storm pipe, 46,000 catch basins, 23 pump stations, 16 miles of city storm tunnel, and another 9.8 miles of MnDOT tunnel that we're responsible for maintaining and more than 400 outfalls into our receiving waters. I want to be clear that stormwater is not treated at a storm, like a, a management facility or a treatment plant. What falls on our, or spills in our city streets and on the, in the gutters ends up in our water bodies. There are some treatment opportunities such as stormwater ponds, green stormwater infrastructure, underground grit chambers and facilities like that, but stormwater is not treated like an industrial facility. Adopted in 1972, the Clean Water Act is the regulatory basis for permitting discharges into waterways. These permits regulate industry, construction sites, and city storm sewer systems. In Minnesota, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency administers the Clean Water Act. Um, these are also known as NPDES permits. We're full of acronyms in stormwater. Because of the unique relationship between the City of Minneapolis and the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board, the two are co-permittees in the stormwater permit and are required to abide by the same regulations and requirements. One of the most significant series of events that led to the passage of the Clean Water Act was the Cuyahoga River in Ohio catching on fire. The picture above was taken during a 1969 fire. The pollution was so thick on the water that the, lit the river literally burned. The picture on the right is from the early 1970s and shows where the Cuyahoga River enters Lake Erie. Industrial discharges like th that caused this level of pollution were the first to be regulated under the Clean Water Act. Under the Clean Water Act, uh, Minneapolis, like other cities, is required to manage city stormwater to keep pollutants from degrading its waters. All of this regulation ultimately drives us to two main goals. We want water resources, lakes, creeks, and the river that are fishable and swimmable. The most significant pollutants that we deal with within urban stormwater are sediments from construction sites, phosphorus, which is nutrients, bacteria, and chloride. I just showed you pictures of the impacts of industry on the Rust Belt of Ohio, but Minnesota has its own unique concerns. Uh, this picture is where the St. Croix River meets the Mississippi River after the Minnesota has joined it. The level of sediment in the river is continuing to flow downstream, and it's anticipated that Lake Pepin will be filled within just 300 years. The city's stormwater management work is guided by two important documents. The first is our water resources management plan. This document is completed as part of the comprehensive plan process, which most recently was the Minneapolis 2040 plan. It speaks to the city's goals and aspirations around our system management and planning. The second document is our stormwater management program document that we call our swamp. This is a regulatory document. It outlines the specific things that the city must do to stay in compliance with our Clean Water Act permit. Not being in compliance with the requirements of our swamp can leave the city open to enforcement action from the EPA and the State Pollution Control Agency. The swamp outlines the specific things that the city has to do on an ongoing basis and any new programs or initiatives will be undertaking um, over the five-year permit term that began in 2019. The swamp describes work plans, timelines, and participating departments across the city with responsibility towards stormwater protection and management. 
For example, it describes our need for establishing public education programs with tar target audiences and pollutants identified. It describes how the city manages spill response and how frequently we must inspect our stormwater ponds, green infrastructure, and underground grit chambers. It requires us to set out enforcement actions for those violating sediment and erosion control ordinances. And it talks about how the city must manage our facilities, such as public works yards, to minimize the impacts that our work has on water bodies. I mentioned previously some of the most significant pollutants that the city needs to address. One of these is chloride. The primary source of chloride in an urban environment is salt applied in the winter to roads, parking lots, and sidewalks. Salt is an important component to our winter safety routines. However, when snow and ice melt, the salt goes with it, washing into our lakes, creeks, river, and even into the groundwater. Once in the water, chloride becomes a permanent pollutant and continues to accumulate in the environment over time. It's estimated that roughly 78% of the salt applied in the Twin Cities metro stays in the region's watershed. And it only takes a teaspoon of salt to contaminate a five gallon bucket of water to the point where many bugs and other macroinvertebrates can no longer survive. As you can see in the chart above, Nationwide, the use of chlorides for winter street maintenance has increased significantly over the past 60 years. One success story that we're seeing is the decrease in the amount of road salt that is being put down by Minneapolis Public Works. This chart is from our annual report and shows that the amount of salt used by our transportation and maintenance group has steadily decreased over the past 20 years. We thought that this decrease may be due to climate change and the impacts that warmer winters are having on our, our salt application. This chart shows the amount of sand and salt being used by public works per day below freezing. So we're still seeing a significant decrease in salt over time, even when taking warmer winters into account. The other area where we've seen success is with our combined sewer system. I mentioned earlier that Minneapolis began separating our stormwater and sanitary sewer systems back in the 1930s. Over time, we've seen fewer and fewer events where we've released sewage into the river doing, due to storm events. Minneapolis has not had a single sewage overflow to the river since 2010. The city has addressed and made progress on significant water quality issues in the past, but there are always emerging concerns that we have to work to address. The most recent of these, as you can see from the submitted public comments, is litter in our water bodies. We have a significant litter problem in Lake Hiawatha. The chart on this slide shows the litter scores tallied by the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board during their regular summer sampling events. Lake Hiawatha is the line in yellow. You can see that there's a significant problem in this lake that is not being seen elsewhere in Minneapolis. We've been able to start working on understanding this problem. Litter comes from somewhere, so we've begun gun hotspot mapping, looking for patterns on the sources of the problem. Once we have a better understanding on the sources, we can start targeting reduction. Are there commercial businesses that aren't emptying their trash cans? Are there construction sites or apartment complexes that aren't securing their dumpsters? Is there a heavier amount of litter around major bus routes? Knowing this information will then guide what we do next. Besides source identification, another thing that we're working on is litter characterization. What are we actually seeing polluting the lake? This is another avenue for us to look at when exploring how to minimize this problem. Due to the issues we are seeing with litter, staff is recommending changes to our stormwater management program or our swamp document. These changes include acknowledging litter as a pollutant of concern and residential, commercial, and business waste as a source. We are recommending changes to the public education and outreach, public participation and engagement, um, illicit discharge detection and elimination, construction site stormwater runoff, controls, 
and pollution prevention and good housekeeping for municipal operations section of our swamp to better address this issue. Today we are coming to you for, with three actions. The first is to hold a public hearing to understand from the community what their concerns are with stormwater management in the city of Minneapolis. The second is to authorize staff to send the annual report to the State Pollution Control Agency as is required under our permit by June 30th. And the third is to approve the changes to the stormwater management program and to authorize staff to submit that revised document to the MPCA for review and approval. I wanna say thank you for your time this afternoon and I'm here to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Ms. Stout. We really appreciate the presentation. I'll quick see if any committee members have questions for Ms. Stout. Not seeing any. Really, again, thank you. Really appreciate it. We'll now move to opening the public hearing. So I see uh, six speakers signed up today. And then if you're not signed up yet, you can certainly talk to our clerks over here if you're interested in speaking on this item. And we also have a, a timer uh, set up as well for folks. So if you can limit your comments, please, to three minutes, that would be appreciated. Uh, and our clerks will help us with that. So uh, our first speaker signed up is Sheila Wegman. Welcome, Sheila. Thank you. Um, uh, good afternoon, commissioners. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this. Um, as you said, my name is Sheila Wigman. I'm here as a volunteer representing the, the North Star Sierra Club. Um, Sierra Club is a nonprofit environmental organization with 20,000 members and 80,000 supporters in Minnesota. Uh, and uh, it is a, a leading grassroots voice to empower uh, vol uh, volunteer voices in Minnesota. Um, Previously, we have expressed concern about the stormwater issues that plague Lake Hiawatha and other lakes, rivers, and streams in Minneapolis over the years. We are especially concerned about the stormwater impacts resulting in the continual presence of trash, plastic, microplastics, hazardous materials, oil, oil auto um, fluids, fertilizers, syringes, and waste of all sorts in the lake has been documented by um, through a number of efforts, including Friends of Lake Hiawatha as well by the city. And um, we have had a chance to review the, the proposed changes to the stormwater management program. And um, we do support the addition of litter as a, as a pollutant. Secondly, we support the um, proposed changes to the illicit discharge and pollution prevention programs that will, that will help um, decrease the uh, litter that is uh, discharged through the stormwater um, system as well as other pollutants that, that are of concern. Um, and lastly, we were able to see the, um, the response to comments and we appreciate them. Uh, and there's a discussion in the response to comments of uh, structural best management practices for, pollu for pollution control, uh, pollutant control in Lake Hiawatha. We appreciate that. And, and um, that is really what the, the main uh, emphasis of the uh, stormwater management um, program is the use of best management practices. Some are structural, meaning they're, they're ponds and it could be any uh, chambers and any sort of um, uh, hard, uh, hard uh, treatment that, that uh, can be used for um, stormwater, as well as the, the softer ones called non-structural, which are the education and, um, uh, and outreach and a number of others like that. Um, so those are the things we support, but we also recommend that uh, the uh, stormwater management program uh, include uh, a, a written requirement for the assessment, installation, and maintenance of structural best management practices within the storm sewer system and at the 43rd Street pipe that discharges into Lake Hiawatha. Um, and also that this be completed and operating within a, a spe specified period of time um, to ensure that this best management practice is implemented. Um, so trash and, and similar waste are not tolerated in lakes across the, the country. We've done some research with the US EPA and with um, in other cities and, and uh, states, and thank you very much. 
Thank you. Really appreciate that. And and for folks, if when you hear that, um, feel free to wrap up your sentence too. It's not like you got to um, drop right there, but we really appreciate the comments. Thank you, uh, Sheila. Next, we have Sean Connedy. Welcome, Sean. Hello, council members. Thanks for having us, and thank you for a great presentation. And and we so value that uh, that uh, trash is being considered as a pollutant. That's awesome. Um, so, Sean Connedy, Ward 12. Um, I'm chair of Friends of Lake Hiawatha, and um, so Lake Hiawatha is home to 255 species of animals, including endangered and vulnerable species, and a critical stop on the Mississippi River Flyway. Yet the lake is choked with trash and impaired by bacteria and phosphorus pollution, causing eutrophication, repeating al toxic algal blooms, and a substantial amount of pollution originates through golf course pumping and through the 43rd Street pipe storm sewer. Uh, we live in a world that's saturated with plastic products and plastic packaging. Um, though a vital component of stormwater management, no amount of street cleaning Volunteers, street sweeping, education can accomplish the goal of keeping trash from <coughs> flowing into Lake Hiawatha from this pipe. The pipe shed area is too massive, densely populated, and trash accumulates on the streets by the hour. Uh, we have also learned that no amount of volunteer labor can remove all the plastic accumulating on the shore, in the soil, in the water at Lake Hiawatha. And for eight years, we have asked for comprehensive stormwater treatment and labored to remove the plastic trash from Lake Hiawatha one piece at a time. Uh, 10,140 pounds is our total currently. Trash is not considered a pollutant in the state of Minnesota. This results in a lack of enforcement that has meant that unaddressed plastic trash accumulating for decades has now broken down into microplastics. Our agencies have no obligation to address this problem. That is why we celebrate and commend city staff for the meaningful step that has been taken to acknowledge that trash is indeed a pollutant of concern. In review of the updated SWMP, there are great programmatic efforts, but we need specific commitments to mitigation, treatment, and removal. And in order to uh, remove the impairment of beneficial uses, comprehensive stormwater treatment is required addressing trash, sediment, and dissolved pollutants. Uh, the PWI committee should be firm on assessment, installation, maintenance of structural best management practices within the storm sewer system and at the 43rd Street pipe discharge to be completed as soon as possible with the maximum removal of solid waste and other pollutants within one year based on an enforceable schedule. In order to address the phosphorus impairment of Lake Hiawatha, we also request site-specific phosphorus monitoring for discharges originating from golf course pumping and the 43rd Street pipe. Golf course pumping is arguably part of the Minneapolis stormwater conveyance system. Total phosphorus loads discharged into Lake Hiawatha from pumping are increasing. The annual volume of pumping has increased from 240 million in 2015 to 400 million gallons currently, and this unaccounted for increase in phosphorus loading to Lake Hiawatha is harmful in contradiction of the city's TMDL phosphorus reduction obligations. Thank you, sorry that went over. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate you being here. Uh, Carol, Carol Dungan. Is Carol here today? Oh, I hear, yeah, perfect. All right, thank you. Thank you, welcome, Carol. Thank you. Uh, my name is Carol Dungan. I am a resident of Ward 12. I am a member of the SENA uh, Neighborhood Association Board, and I'm also a volunteer with Friends of Lake Hiawatha. Um, I'm also a parent, and I think I'm just gonna speak to you uh, as a parent of children who grew up on the shores of Lake Hiawatha. Um, I think it's safe to say that the, the lake and the park helped us raise our kids. And one of the more heartbreaking aspects of living where we live is 
the lake is so beautiful and they can't go into it. Um, the one time that uh, we did let them swim, uh, they came out with rashes and hives uh, due to the, the pollutants in, in the lake. Um, I've recently begun volunteering with Friends of Lake Hiawatha and I can attest to everything that Sean and Sheila say. They are the experts and I'm not gonna you know, try and add anything into that except that I do find it extremely encouraging that uh, trash is now going to be um, considered a, a pollutant of concern. Um, the reason for this is that uh, when I volunteer with the, um, the cleanups on Saturday mornings, um, I've had the opportunity to work with young people who uh, came and uh, helped us with the cleanup. And watching them dig down into the dirt and find more plastic, more hypodermic needles, more used condoms, more tampon applicators um, is heartbreaking. You know, the lake should be a place of refuge not only for the people that live there, but for the people that visit. Um, generations of, of neighbors have come to celebrate milestones in their lives. And you know, I see this every day when I walk by the lake. And usually there is somebody swimming in the lake. You know, either they don't know or they don't think that um, you know, it's gonna be harmful. But I have to think about you know, the fact that this unfiltered pumping is happening within spitting distance of a park preschool, a playground, and uh, a park and walking path that, that we have to use. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say um, is that I think one of the things that makes Minneapolis such a, a wonderful place to live is the commitment to making the city better and um, you know I think what I'm asking you to do as a citizen and as, an, and as a parent is to move this ahead as, as quickly as possible. Um, I've lived in the neighborhood for 16 years. Um, the folks here have been picking up trash for eight years. We can't wait another eight years. This has to be done as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you Carol. We appreciate you being here. Uh, Kristen Olson. Welcome, Kristen. Thank you. Um, my name is Kristen Olson, and I live on 29th Avenue South in Ward 12, a block from Lake Hiawatha, and I'm here today as a Minneapolis resident. Over the past several years, I have helped pick up trash at the lake, including as Carol just mentioned, um, tampon applicators, syringes, condoms, oven cleaner, straws, wrappers, bottles, rusted pop cans, and plastic of every color, shape, and size. I became aware, too, of less visible pollution, such as motor oil and lawn chemicals that rain washes into the lake unfiltered through the 43rd Street pipe. At first, when I started picking up the trash, I was shocked that a city that prizes its lakes would allow this to occur. After years of government inaction, I now feel sorrow and outrage too, especially because the problem will worsen in the future as climate change brings more fre frequent rainstorms. I'm concerned about the deterioration of Lake Hiawatha, which I see as the centerpiece of our neighborhood if nothing is done. Thank you so much for um, proposing to add litter to the, as a component of the um, stormwater, stormwater management program is definitely a step in the right direction, and I appreciate that. It's also critical that the plan include more than just a new word, though. We need an action plan with physical systems to address, address the trash, sediment, and dissolved pollutants that flow through the 43rd Street pipe discharge. We need a specific timetable and enforcement. Our neighborhood and all its residents, including the people and the wildlife that depend on the lake, deserve clean water. Words matter, but words alone won't clean up the lake. Please add structural best management practices, an aggressive timetable, and enforcement to clean up our lakes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kristen. We appreciate you uh, showing up for our, our public hearing today. 
Next, we have Ed Feline. Welcome, Ed. Thank you. Uh, please stop using us as your dumping ground. You are poisoning us. Chemicals that you put on your lawns in Linden Hills come down Minnehaha Creek and end up in Lake Hiawatha. Come and see your blue-green foam that washes to the shore, but don't let your dogs drink it. It could be lethal. And it is not safe for children to swim the lake. My mother taught me to swim in Lake Hiawatha. Theodore Wirth designed Lake Hiawatha Park in 1924. He dredged the lake in 1929 to a depth of 33 feet so kids from the proletarian part of town would have some place to go swimming in the summer. But the city started sanding the streets in winter and washing that sand down storm sewers from Lake Street to 43rd Street, from Chicago Avenue to 27th Avenue into Lake Hiawatha. And now it's hard to find anywhere on the lake that's 12 feet deep. It's so shallow, aquatic life cannot survive the winter. Kids can't swim in the... The city needs to dredge the lake on a regular basis as simple maintenance and restore it to its original depth of 33 feet. The goal of increasing stormwater capacity and the problem of collapsing peat soil infrastructure around Lake Nokomis and Hiawatha can both be resolved by removing the five-foot dam weir at 27th Avenue and other obstructions that stop the natural flow of water out of Lake Hiawatha. Lowering the lake level by 4.5 to 5 feet would increase stormwater storage in Lake Hiawatha by 80 million gallons. And it would drain the water table by five feet. Draining five feet of saturated peat soil around Lake Hiawatha will help drain saturated peat soil around Lake Nokomis and Solomon Park because peat soil connecting those areas is so porous and spongy that like a wick, it can carry uh, water uphill, and then when it rains, the water has nowhere to go. The rain from above meets the water below. Please stop poisoning us with chemicals. Start cleaning up your sand. Get the park board to take down the damn weir, and then bag the garbage with a net coming out of the storm tunnel and have the creek run through a, flo a flocculation chamber like Richfield does at Taft Lake to remove the poisonous phosphorus that gets into the lake. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. We appreciate you being here. Uh, next, we have Bryn Casper. And I'm seeing head shaking, so I'm guessing Bryn is not here and not in the overflow. So I will see if there's anyone else here who would like to speak on this item who is not signed up yet, because that was our last registered speaker. We'll give it just a few seconds for anyone over in the overflow who's interested. So going once, going twice. All right, well, thank you, everyone. We're going to go ahead and close the public hearing. And I will see if any of my colleagues have any questions or comments on this item before us. Not seeing any, I uh, did through the clerk distribute a substitute resolution on this item. Uh, so the original resolution was adopting both the uh, phase one permit, uh, the actual stormwater management program and the annual report for activities. Clearly we've heard a lot of great testimony today around concerns with uh, in particular Lake Hiawatha and all the pollution running into it. And so I've talked with staff about this program and if we can take some more time to look at BMPs and other uh, potential amendments to this program to strengthen it to address the concerns around Lake Hiawatha and uh, worked with staff on this resolution. So this will move the annual report which is required uh, to uh, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. So it will approve that and move that forward, but then we'll uh, hold over the stormwater management program so we can take a closer look and bring that back in uh, the next cycle or an upcoming cycle. So I will go ahead and move that uh, substitute 
for the resolution on number one. And uh, I will see if the clerks want to correct me on anything with that motion, but I think that motion should be good. So I will see if my colleagues have any comments or questions on that motion. Uh, at committee, no, I don't think so. We don't need a second because we're at committee, right? Yep, perfect. All right. So I do not see any further discussion or questions on that. So I will ask the clerk to call the roll the roll on that item. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember <clears throat> Chugtai. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Chair Johnson. Aye. There are five ayes. So that substitute passes. So then we're left with the underlying uh, passage of this now substituted resolution and the authorizing public works to submit that annual report to the PCA for review and approval. So I will see if there's any additional comments or questions on that. Not seeing any, so I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Council Member Payne. Aye. Council Member Wansley. Aye. Council Member Chugtai. Aye. Council Member Koski. Aye. Chair Johnson. Aye. There are five ayes. That motion carries. And again, I really want to thank everyone who showed up to speak today on this and looking forward to continued discussion and really appreciate our staff as well, and specifically the mention of Lake Hiawatha and the issues going on there. Uh, certainly, it is a broad-reaching uh, concern for folks, not just in Ward 12, Ward 11 as well, and uh, the south side. So we want to make sure that uh, we're doing everything we can to have a clean, healthy lake and also manage our stormwater effectively. So thank you all. Uh, we will now move on to our final item, which is a discussion item on Hennepin Avenue South Street Reconstruction Project. And I will call on Director Anderson Kelleher to see if we have any additional uh, staff presentation or comments on this uh, before turning over to these items. So thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think that um, because this item is at this point essentially unchanged from when it was before uh, committee last time, I will introduce uh, folks who can answer questions about uh, the items before it. And if it's your pleasure, certainly they can come up to the podium at any time. But we have uh, with us today both uh, Jennifer Hager, Director of Transportation and Planning and Programming, and Brian Dodds, who's the Deputy Director, uh, one of two, and also our City Engineer with us today. Perfect. Thank you, Director. We really appreciate that and appreciate Ms. Hager and uh, Mr. Dodds for being here today as well uh, for the committee to be available. And so I just want to make sure I clear this with our uh, clerk here. I know there's some different motions, so I'm thinking what I'll do is we've got uh, items four and then one through five listed. So I was thinking I would take up each of these individually and just want to make sure I don't need to do any additional motions to do that and walk through. Uh, if we don't have any objections from committee members. So I'm seeing uh, head nods. So uh, we'll go ahead and start with item one, item number one, approving the layout for Hennepin Avenue South Street reconstruction project between Douglas Avenue and West Lake Street. And I will see if any colleagues have any motions on that. Council member Chugtai. Thank you, Chair Johnson. Um, in front of uh, committee members today um, and with our attorneys as well as um, at the side over there are copies of um, an amendment to item 4.1, approving the layout for the Hennepin Avenue South Street reconstruction project between Douglas Avenue and West Lake Street. Um, as you'll remember in our last Public Works and Infrastructure Committee meeting, we brought forward um, a substitute motion, and I know we're gonna get to that later, but um, over the the week uh, following um, following committee and before we got to council, um, you know, we've we've received actually a lot of updated information from our city attorney's office and have been able to um, make some changes to to make sure that we are within the scope of council authority. Um, and so, after you know, working closely with the city attorney's office, our clerks, um, and our public works leadership team, we're bringing forward a couple of different items. So this is the first of them. The amendment. Um, 
is um, to, to the attachment labeled the Hennepin Avenue South Reconstruction Project Layout. Um, and it's titled the Hennepin South Reconstruction Lake Street to Douglas Avenue Recommended Design Layout from um, 5-22-2022. Um, and what we're doing is providing that all areas, components, thoroughways and zones designated as transit lane and reflected in red, which you can see on the map, um, should be designated as transit lane, no parking, and to provide that no parking is authorized in those areas, components, thoroughways, and or zones throughout the re reconstructed corridor upon project completion and to further direct staff in the Public Works Department to amend all underlying plan documents, including the complete streets checklist to effectuate this change in policy for the Hennepin Avenue South Corridor. This is essentially doing um, you know, the same thing that we were intending to do with the staff direction, but it is more clear legislation and it is more clear within the scope of authority of um, the city and, and this council. Thank you, Councilmember Tugtai. Do we have any comments or questions from council members on this motion? Councilmember Koski. Thank you, Chair Johnson. I just wanted to, could you just clarify a little bit so I'm understanding that this is going to be a label on, or it's a designated label on the new layout plan? Yeah, so that's a that's I a really a visual person. Yes, that's a really good question. We did um, play around with the idea of uh, drawing on the map and submitting it as an amendment, but decided that that was uh, not the right call. Um, and so, like, really think of the so. Um, on the map, which is the physical document that we um, we are approving, it is designating that transit lane as um, as a a dedicated transit lane, right? A transit lane where there is not parking. Um, and it, um, it, you know, like the map itself is, uh, it's the, the, the physical um, document that has a bunch of supporting documents that, you know, inform it. Um, and so to make sure that all of the supporting items line up with that, with that change. Thank you. Um, so I don't know if I direct this to you or... <laughs> um, one of the attorneys. I'm just curious to know, you know, I'm a new council member. I'm just wondering, is this typical? Do we, have we, do as a council, as a body, have we uh, changed labels and layout like, or, or I guess labels that way in, in the past or for other projects? Or is this something that typically happens or is this new? Uh, I will ask our city attorney to weigh in on that and, and maybe just add around our authority as well as this within the authority, I think, is also it, part of uh, the question or is at least a fair question to ask. Uh, sure. Uh, Chair Johnson, uh, Council Member Koski, um, I'd be happy to, to discuss particularly as it relates to the uh, authority here. Um, the history as, as whether or not uh, in, in past practices the council has amended legends or maps or labels, um, I cannot speak to that. I would defer to our public works staff uh, to answer that question. Um, I do believe that uh, we, we are circling back to the conversation we had uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago um, regarding some of these uh, lane designations and the delegation of authority to the director of public works um, through a couple of prior council actions. Um, I'll also note, and, and first of all, I want to be clear, um, the council, of course, has the authority to legislate within the city of Minneapolis, okay? Um, the charter has, has given you that, that authority. Uh, the issue is, is simply with these previous council actions that have given that power to the director of public works. Um, and so uh, the options you have available are, are amending um, previous actions. Um, revising previous delegations, um, or even uh, particularly as we, we talk about um, parking regulations and restrictions, um, you do have the authority via ordinance, um, and 478.90 is one example in which um, you can regulate the manner and methods of parking. Uh, that being said, that was would require an ordinance. Uh, it would have to be uniformly applicable across the city, and it would have to be a separate action. Um, and so I just wanted to uh, mention that I think this proposal before you right now 
um, circles back to some of those concerns that were raised a couple of weeks ago as written um, uh, regarding the delegation of authority to the Director of Public Works. And um, it would be my position that this is, uh, you know, getting into that lane designation operational decision making uh, that you've given to the Director of Public Works. And <laughs> Council Member Koski, and then I, I think I'll uh, call on Council Member Chugtai after that because I think that there, I'm sure you've had conversations with the city attorney's office around this as well. Okay, I just wanted to get clarity here because there were based kind of two questions. One, we'd have to kind of, Public Works would have to answer if Council adding information or directing information on a legend uh, or label, maybe Public Works can help us answer, answer that. But what I'm hearing you say is that this is still kind of crossing the line of our authority, or, or is that not is that not what I'm hearing? Councilmember uh, Johnson or Chair Johnson, Councilmember Koski, um, I believe you know to clarify, you, you absolutely have the authority and the power, right? It's just the matter of how you get to that end. Uh, and I believe that with the um, action that you have previously taken, the 1995 delegation as well as um, uh, the city ordinance in which you entrust the, the management and operation and control of the right of way to the director of public works, you would need to take uh, action to revise or amend those previous delegations if you wanted to proceed uh, with a directive like this. The alternative, um, which, which you may not need to take those you may not need to rescind or amend those previous actions, uh, would be something like the parking ordinance 478.90, um, and you could explore potentially adding additional uh, conditions with respect to the parking ordinance. I will state, though, that you know an ordinance requires uniform applicability across the city, uh, and it wouldn't be able to be narrowly tailored to this uh, specific program. Um, but that is one option as you, um, you know, decide how, how to move forward. Thank you, Councilman Murkowski. And I know um, Public Works is interested in responding maybe on that piece about the history, but I, I think it makes sense to have uh, Councilman Member Chuck Tai uh, just speak to uh, any interactions with the city attorney's office, just kind of in response yeah, to for this sure. dynamic. I'm happy to do that. I think, uh, thank you, Chair Johnson, Councilman Member uh, This is a really good line of questions, and I think one that we've spent the last few weeks really digging in on and getting really clear about our, our lanes and our, uh, our way of approaching, right? So sure, you know, it's, it's um, like both the staff direction, um, and this amendment, all of these things are different ways and routes of getting to an outcome, right? When you ask the question of, well, why are we amending a map legend? Is this normal? Is this, does this happen previously? It, it, it's really about trying to get to ensuring that the E-line is able to run, and this was the way for us to get there. Um, so a couple of pieces to, to speak to that just a little bit. One, I wanna to speak to the 1995 resolution that Mr. Wilcox was referencing earlier. Um, that resolution certainly does designate power to the public works director and to the city attorney to make decisions not on operations, but on a list of things that it lists, right? It says bus stops and stop signs, a, a list of different things that, that we have delegated authority to um, the public works director and to the um, city engineer. The last sentence of that exact resolution actually reads, if any recommended action by the director of transportation is not approved by the council member of the affected ward, it shall be placed as a matter of, re of review by the transportation and public works committee. And then it's, there's a letter that actually came attached with it um, that, was, um, that was sent uh, uh, to the, um, the, the chair of the Transportation Public Works Committee at that time, signed by the Public Works Director at that time, that also read, if any recommended action by the Director of Transportation is not to the satisfaction of the council member, then any such items will be placed on the Transportation and Public Works agenda for discussion and final review. Final review and authority in this body is always taken by the council. So whether whether we, you know, whether we wanna, you know, go uh, back and forth on, on designation of power and council authority, the, the, the resolution that's being referenced over and over again, right, as the trump card for you don't get to make this decision, somebody else does, gives me 
as the council member who represents this community, the power to pull that item and to ultimately make that final decision as a body, as a council, then to be reviewed by the mayor, of course. Um, so that's, I think, one important piece of this. And then second is, um, you know, both this amendment and all actions that are gonna be brought in front of you um, today uh, that, that came from my office and, and that came from me have actually been reviewed by our deputy city attorney and have been approved by our deputy city attorney as things that are within the scope um, of power that the, that the council has. So, you know, I, I, I think it's good that we're having this discussion on the public record. I think it's good for, for you know, for, for people to see that we've done our homework and we've done our work to make sure that we are, you know, coloring within the lines. Thank you, Councilmember Chugtai. And I don't know if that needs any response from City Attorney Wilcox and Sure, uh, Chair Johnson, Councilmember Chugtai, I, I appreciate just a, a quick opportunity to respond. Uh, Councilmember, you, you referenced the 1995 resolution. You're spot on. Obviously, there is the provision when the city implemented the special law that it received from the legislature uh, that the affected um, council member of the ward needs to be uh, provided notice. And then uh, if, if that council member disagrees with the action, uh, it has to be placed on the agenda. Um, however, that's just one of the delegations we reference. Um, Minneapolis Code 451.30B is another source where you've delegated authority to the Director of Public Works uh, with respect to the um, operate, quote, operation, maintenance, and control over city-owned um, infrastructure and city-managed public rights of way. Um, so that's, that's kind of where, where we're at here is there are these multiple sources of delegation of power. Um, but once again, these aren't these aren't uh, delegations that you're, you know, you have to just throw your hands up. You, of course, can take action to, uh, to, to modify uh, or amend previous delegations. And, and, and circling back um, to this, this amendment before us, uh, if, the, if the intent, if the council intent um, is to uh, ultimately, uh, you know, create an enforcement mechanism where a penalty could be assessed for parking in that area, a resolution is going to be an ineffective way of doing that. Uh, only an ordinance can assess a, a violation, a penalty uh, for violation. So, um, you know, if, if we think about uh, citations that ultimately go into prosecution as petty misdemeanors in, in a court or something along those lines, that requires an ordinance uh, and it requires a penalty to be prescribed. So, so this amendment um, is, is uh, going to be ineffective if that's, if that's the intent. Um, and then furthermore, we just go back kind of to that uh, distinction between reviewing the proposed action of public works versus the ability to change or modify uh, the plan. And I think, um, I think there is a little bit of a distinction there. Thank you, Mr. Wilcox. Um, and I don't know, Councilmember Chugtai, if you have anything. Yeah. To add in there. Um, and then we'll go to our director to answer. I mean, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. I, I'll just say, like, these actions have been vetted and approved by our deputy city attorney. And so I don't, I don't quite understand, um, you know, why we're ending up in a back and forth on council authority again. Um, and, like, you know, uh, sure. If if what you're reading is is like that, in the same way that you're telling me that uh, you know the resolution gives council the authority to review, but perhaps uh, it doesn't say review and amend or change. Uh, the intent of that resolution is actually explained very explicitly by the the then director of public works and so like that's i think one piece of it and in the same way that like you know you can designate power to someone else it does not mean that it is it, it is you have the absence of it right and so that type of logic can actually be applied both ways in and the end result of both of those is that this amendment is fully within the the authority that this body has Thank you, Councilmember Chuktai. And I know there was a, another part of uh, Councilmember Koski's question around uh, has the council made modifications before amendments to the layout? So, uh, Director Anderson Kelleher. So, Mr. Chair and Councilmember Koski, and thank you for the question. And I, um, I first want to start by saying what is this plan that you are being asked a plan layout. A plan layout is a 30% layout of a project. You are asked to approve the curb line 
and basic roadway geometry, you are not being asked to approve operations of the roadway. And to that point, I think that is why, and I have been here three months, but we we've talked to our staff, and we have people who have been here much, much longer, uh, about 50 years of combined experience in Minneapolis Public Works. They can never remember a layout being amended in this way. Thank you, Director. Councilmember Koski, do you have any additional comments or questions on this item? No, I'm good. Okay, Thank you. sounds good. Council Member Chuck Tai, I see, I see people's. All right, uh, Council Member Payne. Uh, thank you, Chair Johnson. Yeah, I just want to say, um, seems to be a lot of games here, and it, this should be a pretty straightforward question. There are a number of people on this council that want to see 24-7 bus lanes, and the legality of council's authority seems to be kind of this ball that's tossed in the air that's kind of getting us away from the core question. And the core question is, do we as council have the authority to block parking to create a right of way for a dedicated transit lane? And the answer to that seems to be clearly yes. So I would like to frankly call the question on, on this um, amendment by council member Chuck Tai. And before I ask if that's a formal motion, I will note that council member Wansley did have her tag up before you, but because she stepped out for a moment, that's why I called on you. So if yeah. you are calling to question, it would. I can, I can wait until council member Wansley is back. Okay. Thank you, Let's thank you. Uh, and while we wait for her, I guess I'll uh, go ahead and speak on uh, this item. Uh, I support this amendment today. I understand the legal concerns uh, raised and also understand that council member Chugtai talked to our deputy city attorney uh, in working on this. I also think regardless of that, uh, this amendment does express intention by the council, whether it is at the end of the day legally binding and we can absolutely unquestionably uh, restrict parking on this particular stretch through this action or not. Uh, and I wanna speak to why I support this uh, because I actually think the dynamic lanes are a good concept, but all the evidence I have seen suggests we are going to have serious, serious problems with it. The data that Public Works staff has that they presented during my Hennepin uh, technical briefing was, while it was limited, it was from Hennepin Avenue from last year, just during the evening, and essentially revealed that every single day they are having to issue citations where people are illegally parking in the uh, dynamic lanes that exist today on Hennepin Avenue. And by the way, that's citations, not tows. So it's not actually clearing the problem from the street. It is just ticketing people and leaving obstructions still in the right of way that are uh, impacting bus operations. Uh, on top of that, because of citations, it's well, assuredly underrepresenting the problem because there are plenty of times where people can park there and they frankly don't get cited. And the concern I have is that we're basically, while it's well-intentioned, I believe we are going to end up with stop and go traffic and all it's gonna take is one person parking in that lane out of a couple hundred spots for that to impact operations and then have buses waiting, trying to merge back in, people braking. Ultimately, we've all seen this back up when we're on highways and all of a sudden traffic comes to a standstill, yet there are no accidents, there seems to be no issue. It only takes a slight change in dynamics, especially when you get close to capacity, when you're at higher utilization levels, for there to be a pretty significant impact to operations. So I see how it only takes one person. We know that people are doing this every single day, violating these dynamic lanes, and suddenly you're going to have a big traffic mess. Traffic's gonna be snarled. You're gonna have customers out there uh, getting tickets for these small businesses. You're gonna have bus operations impacted. You're gonna be have the customers mad at the small business owners. You're gonna have the traffic backing up and it's gonna be a mess and we don't really have any examples of us doing this successfully. Now, of course, the idea is, well, within a couple of years, within several years, we'll figure it out. But I would say that puts things backwards. We really need to have some demonstration of success before we ultimately as a council say, we are 
done with this issue and forever are going to have no more control over this. I really want the council to be engaged on this. And I think if we can have success elsewhere, and by the way, as I'm saying this, this isn't just a public works issue, right? I, I want to acknowledge that. This is also uh, a regulatory services. This is a Minneapolis Police Department. This is a Metro Transit and their enforcement arms. So it's, it's a, a complex issue around enforcement, but it hasn't been done really successfully yet. And the data that we have shows that it, it is a problem and there's no reason to believe that it won't be a problem here. And meanwhile, I also have concerns about expectations being set. Everyone seems to have different understandings of what these dynamic lanes are. I've heard business owners say, oh, it's just a couple hours in the morning, couple hours in the afternoon. But the reality is, and Public Works is very transparent about this, it's not determined yet. And in my Hennepin Avenue technical briefing, my understanding was if there are traffic problems, they could immediately take away these dynamic lanes. And so it's even how long they would be there. And by the way, we understand the intention is, right, that we're going to get to eventually having all day bus lanes on Hennepin. That's been clearly stated, uh, even in the discussions around these dynamic lanes, but the idea was to phase it in. Yet everyone is kind of on different spots with where it is and they're reading in different things. And I think that ultimately is just going to set us up for people feeling like they were promised one thing and then they were given another thing. And so I don't think that that's a good approach either on this. And then when I say, what is this all about at the end of the day? When we look at our staff's own data around parking on Hennepin Avenue, this is about approximately 1.5% to a little less than 8% of the total overall available pool of parking. So I appreciate the intentions, but I, I don't think we're ready to move forward with dynamic lanes. And at a minimum, I want the council to weigh in on what is our intention here that we want to convey to staff, um, regardless of this question of authority. What would the council's preference be on this? What do we think is the right situation, given how complex this is? I will also say, uh, in full transparency, I'm open to something in between the idea of 24-7 and uh, this dynamic lane as proposed. But given the options that we have today, I think this uh, makes sense to move forward. And now, saying all of that, I also wanna take a step back here because what is before us is a layout approval for a really, really, really big road reconstruction that's a huge project. Everyone knows this stretch of road in the city and it has taken years of work to get here. So as much as we talk about and are passionate about, and we should be about this question of these, uh, these lanes and whether they're dedicated full-time buses or whether they're dynamic. Let's not lose sight, too, of the larger picture here, that this is a very badly needed reconstruction. And I really wanna commend staff because our staff have been out there for years working on this. And they have followed the policy guidance from the city. They've looked at national best practices on this. They've engaged with hundreds, thousands of stakeholders through countless meetings, listened to sides that oftentimes can be very, very much on different uh, pages with this, and they have consistently been thoughtful, engaged, developed a plan that widely is supported, even though we're talking about one detail here, which really is around uh, use and even transition area, this concept of dynamic lanes. This layout broadly supported. And so I think that really deserves a lot of recognition and I wanna lift that up and I wanna say thank you to our staff and thank you to everybody who's weighed in and helped shape this plan to get us to this point today because this is about so much more than this question of transit lanes or dynamic lanes and I think our staff have really uh, stepped up and gone the extra mile on this one and uh, deserve high praise for a really great job that they've done. Thank you. Council Member Wansley. Thank you, Chair Johnson. Um, I just had a couple of clarifying questions, some of which kind of builds upon what you've already shared. Um, they're mostly directed at our uh, city attorneys. Um, so getting back at this dynamic of, I, I want to be quite frank, the biggest contention point is you know, making sure that 24 seven bus lanes are included in this layout starting on day one. And that was 
part of the original concept that was brought by our amazing staff to council. Um, it is the proposal with those 24 seven bus lanes in which, as you noted, our staff went out and engaged thousands of our residents around and there's tons of public support. There's a public mandate in moving us or having the city move forward with this particular uh, and crucial component of this layout. Um, so from my understanding, Council Member Chuck Ty's amendment that she's brought forward um, is basically guided in this, this intention to ensure that 24 seven bus lanes are included on day one. Based off of what you shared, it's still kind of murky, and thank you, Councilmember Johnson, for crystallizing of, or at least stating that we shouldn't even have to be in this point where we're talking about back and forth about like what is within the scope of legislative authority when this is within the scope of legislative authority. But if this amendment is not it, you noted that we would have to take ordinance actions. I'm just trying to get an understanding of what process needs to happen to get us back to that original layout that council have all been briefed on that the public is aware about what if it's not an amendment what what is that sure uh, chair johnson mr wilcox uh, yes thank you, chair johnson and, and um council member Wansley. Uh, there are really multiple avenues you could take here um first and foremost uh, those original delegations you could amend or rescind um, so uh, I, I referenced the city ordinance, the 1995 resolution as well. You could modify those as council. That's entirely within your authority. Um, and you know, just to clarify again, I said it earlier, but um, at least me sitting in this chair, I'm, I'm number one saying council does not have the authority to do this. I'm saying that you've, it, as, as it currently states, you've delegated some of the authority to public works and the, the proper um, process would be to, you know, claw that back or retake that or amend that, which of course carries with it some, some other considerations. An alternative, um, which I mentioned, uh, would be uh, to amend the no parking ordinance uh, that um, is, is in place in the city of Minneapolis. Um, that is Mini, uh, Minneapolis Code 478.90, and that prescribes parking regulations that the council has established throughout the city, right? Things like, um, you know, you can't park on a sidewalk, you can't park within 20 feet of a, of a fire department, um, you know, entryway. Um, those types of regulations that, that would have uniform applicability throughout the city um, and would carry uh, the weight of enforcement, right? Um, a violation uh, would be enforceable in court. Um, and, and that is something that you could consider Consider, right for example uh, and and uh, of course I wouldn't ever uh, seek to, to try to tell um, our elected officials um, policy that they could consider but um, if you state that there's no parking in uh, transit priority lines um, and and that was you know the case across the city through ordinance through a, you know lawfully enacted ordinance that uh, this body chose to to pursue and and, and adopt and pass and um, that is something that I think would achieve probably the end result that, that you're seeking here, um, but would be doing so in a way that we wouldn't run into this murky issue of, um, hey, is this power, this, is this really just a lane designation that was delegated to the, to the director of public works or not? So I think, I hope that answers your question. There are multiple ways you could, you could you know, look at those um, delegations and, and choose to tweak those, amend those, or you could pursue a, you know entirely different route, route through the parking restrictions because you do have the authority to obviously to, you know, you're the legislative body, you have the authority to regulate the manner and method uh, in which vehicles are parked in the city of Minneapolis, of course. Yes. And I think it somewhat gets at maybe a, a parts of my question. I think the, the original piece is we already had our original policy that was approved by prior council, so prior administration, that included 24-7 bus lanes. That was the original layout. That under our current is not now from day one. Well, that's news to me. But nevertheless, um, I'm more interested in the original layout that I, from my understanding, still prioritized 24 seven on day one. You've mentioned this, Matt, uh, Director um, uh, Margaret Ellison uh, Keller, Keller, that this is the same proposal. If it is, then we should see that reflected in what we're considering. And I don't think it is, hence why we're having Council Member Chuck Ty's amendment, also why I'm supporting it, um, because it does not seem the delegation of, of that, this new exemption of delegation to leadership that now we're seeing this change. And that's 
a very concerning dynamic that we have to cons uh, consider. Considering I had a briefing just several months ago where it was very uh, sure to me by our staff that yes, 24 seven was happening. And now that's questionable. And for those reasons, this is why I'm supporting Chuck Ty's amendment. Thank you, council member and uh, director Anderson. Did you have any response to that? I know there was a question in there. I'm not sure if you were looking. Okay, all right, certainly. Well, Mr. Chair, I think there was a question in there about the process that Public Works goes through on a layout. And the layout that you were briefed on was still in the process of having public comment. There was one last round of public comment that happened. I know that we've provided all of those comments to Council Member Chugtai at this point. And the number one concern in that round of the final round was a concern about parking. And so that is why you see the modification, which is for a dynamic lane with full implementation for all day bus lanes in the very near future. Us working with Metro Transit to establish the hours of the dynamic lane so that it works for them. They have more data about that. That is, that's what you're seeing. It, there was no vote or approval that I am aware of that happened previously to this layout. The layout is a curb to curb layout. It shows you the geometry of the street. It allows us to move this plan, which is a plan at 30% into transportation engineering, which is Mr. Elwood's section as director to be able to get to the work to get this designed. We have two years of design before we begin construction on this project. I guess council members and council member Johnson, that is why we have been really working very hard. We have drafted staff directions that work for the department. We have drafted a resolution that works for the department, but this putting this on the layout is not something that we support. Thank you, director. Council member Koski. Uh, yes. Council member Wanza, are you, are you done? Okay, perfect. All right, Council Member Koski, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Jones. Yeah, I think what I just want to say is I, right now what I'm most concerned about is getting the layout uh, approved by the City Council and by the Mayor so that our Public Works staff can meet their June uh, deadline for the federal funding. And this timeline already is, we're, you know, aggressive. Uh, so I do understand that my fellow council members want to have this conversation about the operations plan, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't, uh, but I, I'm also hearing from the attorney that the best way to go about this isn't meddling necessarily with our layout plan. If it's in the interest of the council members, they should, we can take uh, the recommended channels that, that have been outlined for us today, um, and this conversation about operations plan can and should happen separate from this layout plan. Uh, but that's... That's, I just wanted to state that, and I hope that we can move forward uh, with uh, you know, this layout plan as we, and has been uh, given to us by our public work staff. So, thank you. Thank you, and uh, before I recognize Councilmember Chugtai, I'll just note that we've been joined by Councilmember Rainville. Welcome to the PWI committee. Councilmember Chugtai. Last thing, and then I'll, I'll call the question at the end of this. Um, but I um, just, just wanna, clarify so everyone's on the same page um, we're we're not um, we're not actually getting into the operations plan um, right now we're not getting into the operations plan with this amendment that's why you don't see references to when buses will run and what Metro Transit where it needs to do and what we're asking them of we're, we're this is an amendment to the layout um, to approve this layout, which, you know, I actually think uh, you make an excellent point, and it's something that we've talked about, but I don't know if we've done it on the public record, that we need to complete this layout approval, and we need to do it now. We actually needed to do it months ago, and and we're, we're you know, we're, we've run out the clock, and at this point, we, we need to approve this layout. So with this with this amendment, um, you know, I think we're, we're ready to do that as a council. So with that... Um, I'll call the question. Well, um, maybe I'll just, as a friendly uh, uh, component here, if nobody else has any discussion or comments, we could just go straight to a vote on the amendment. Great. So a informal call to question, we'll call it. Uh, and I'm not seeing any additional comments or questions, so I will ask the clerk to call the roll on this amendment. Councilmember Payne. Aye. 
Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Chugtai. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Nay. Chair Johnson. Aye. There are four ayes and one nay. That motion carries. So we have completed the first of five. Uh, the other ones I think are related though. So we'll now move on to items uh, number two. And I will go ahead and move that item and see if there's any comments or questions on that. And I am not seeing any, so I will go ahead and ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Chugtai. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Chair Johnson. Aye. There are five ayes. That motion carries, so we'll move on to item number three. I'll go ahead and move that item. Are there any comments or questions? Not seeing any, I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Chug Tai. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Chair Johnson. Aye. There are five ayes. That motion carries, and we'll move on to item number four. And uh, I believe there's a substitute for that. Councilmember Chug Tai. Yeah, thank you, Chair Johnson. Um, so uh, I think one of the things that, that we um, learned during our, um, our technical briefing on Hennepin Avenue earlier this week on Monday um, was uh, that in the initial um, items that came to this committee for approval, there was a um, the passage of this resolution um, directing the city engineer to establish restrictions to meet the state aid rule. Um, and this was a, a like a, and we all, we had a ton of questions on this. Um, last time we decided to hold it back in committee and then we're gonna move it forward this time. Um, between committee and, uh, and today, what we've learned is that uh, we actually don't have to um, pass this resolution to meet that state aid rule. And so, you know, um, we are, um, we, so we don't, it's not a requirement for, for state and federal dollars, we believe right now. Um, and so that being said, you know, I'm bringing forward a substitute resolution um, that, uh, you know, still does the, the same exact thing that the previous re resolution was gonna do. It's, it's word for word, the same language, um, but it removes the references to um, needing to um, approve a resolution like this in order to meet the state aid requirement. So we're still doing the same exact thing, um, but, but not for, the, for, for, for checking a box for the state. Um, I think a, a couple of important things to note about this resolution, we do things like this as a council actually all of the time. Just recently, you know, we approved a, um, a, a parking res restriction resolution like this for Upper Harbor Terminal where we removed parking from that, from I think it was Lindale entirely. Um, and this uh, parking resolution actually doesn't do that it it has um exemptions for um for the the uh the loading zones or the parking bays to ensure that you know we're still able to have some parking on um on this corridor um and so um i want to just bring this uh substitute resolution to this committee Thank you, Councilmember Chugtai. So we have a motion for the substitute resolution. I'll see if there are any comments or questions from council members. Councilmember Koski. Thank you, Chair Johnson. So I just wanna get some clarity. I'm not sure who can help answer this uh, question, but to your point, we talked about this and they stated that this was gonna be, this would be unnecessary to move this forward. So I'm curious to know why we can, cannot just remove this altogether, but I am, Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's a really good question. So we do not need to move this forward in order to meet the state's requirement for, for you know, moving forward with this reconstruction. We are moving this forward because we are, um, we are, we are, you know, removing parking with the exception of um, the specific 
zones from Hennepin Avenue, which we were doing kind of no matter what. And then we've been having this separate conversation about, you know, some parking sometime for a little while in the transit lanes. And so it's to, you know, remove that chaos and confusion and be really, really clear about exactly where on Hennepin Avenue a person can park. Councilmember Koski. Thank you. Yeah, maybe someone from Public Works can help answer. Is this still necessary for us to have this resolution in order for us to do this, uh, these restrictions? So we'll see if either Director Anderson Kelleher or if Mr. Dodds would like to address this. So I'll, I'll start, Mr. Chair and Councilman Murkowski. In diving down into the weeds on this issue after three weeks ago, this has been a step that is unnecessary and has been being done unnecessarily, frankly, and making work for all of you. Uh, because this was covered by that original, or the law change, uh, the legislative law change, and then the practice had been to continue to bring this. There's nothing in the legislation that says you have to bring this, and the state aid um, division or uh, of MnDOT has told us because it's a delegated authority, it is not needed. Minneapolis is unique in this way. I will say that. We have, uh, because of that law change, it has probably, um, there's a number of things that allow you to not have to do things that would maybe seem very small in a city of our size. So the answer is we do not need this. This essentially has the action of banning parking on Hennepin Avenue, but for 20 spaces. Councilmember Koski, anything else to add? No. All right. Councilmember Chugtai, still see your tag up? All right. Any additional comments or questions on the substitute motion? Not seeing any, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Chugtai. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Nay. Chair Johnson. Aye. There are four ayes and one nay. That motion carries. And now we'll move on to the fifth item. And if uh, this is actually a staff direction from Councilmember Chugtai. Councilmember Chugtai. Um, so I am um, going to ask to delete this item. Um, it is. Uh, we've, I mean, we've had extensive conversations at this point on, on this staff direction, so just want to delete it and think the, the amendment and the substitute cover the intent and is the more proper legislative way of going about doing it. Thank you, uh, Customer Shuktai. And I'll just look to our clerk's office. Do we need a formal motion to delete? Okay, so we'll end up doing a roll call on that, but I see a comment or question from Customer Wansley. Oh, oh, after five. Okay, perfect. Uh, I will see any additional comments or questions on that. Not seeing any, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Chugtai. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Chair Johnson. Aye. There are five ayes. That motion carries. And before uh, that complete, well, that completes item number four for us today. And before we adjourn, I uh, see Councilmember Wansley for a comment or question. Yeah, this is more of a comment. Um, I just wanted to get this on public record, especially now that this process is moving next week into kind of a more full council discussion. Um, I just wanted to put on public record some of my frustrations and major concerns about how this project has been moved forward over the past few months and highlight it to the connection um, to what, as you noted, Councilmember Johnson, is clearly an entre uh, enterprise-wide um, problem. Um, our current city has major credibility issues right now, and I believe that this project and the way that our leadership has handled it um, is indicative of uh, a city's problem, our city's problem with breaking away from the status quo, um, which inherently does not include or prioritize people of color, low-income folks, renters, students, and those with accessibility needs. Um, as we noted earlier about how the discussion around 24 24-7 bus lines was already included in 
original council action. Um, this, partic this, this was laid out when city council approved the transportation action plan last year. Under action uh, transit 2.5, uh, 2 it states that road construction projects on high uh, frequency transit corridors allocate dedicate space or allocate and de uh, dedicate space for bus only lanes and other transit advantages. The original Hennepin reconstruction design that was presented to council and the community for input fully met this policy and, and achieved setting a new standard in how our roads are designed as we move into a greener, cleaner, and equitable future. And this is really important because I hope we all know that Minneapolis has some of the worst race, uh, racial disparities in the nation. And that's been noted as a theme throughout, again, our entire enterprise. And it seems to be a pattern or a practice amongst our leadership to hide or weaken policy solutions brought forward by our staff that will actually have significant impact on bettering the lives of working class people in our city. So I just want the public to be aware of this dynamic because this Hennepin project, as you know, the council member Johnson is so much more of, it, it sets a new precedence for how we really embrace um, a new uh, road infrastructure in our city that really champions the needs of working class people and BIPOC communities. Um, and I'm very saddened to see that our leadership could continue throughout this process to conflate issues between what's in I, our I, authority. Council, yeah. Council Member Wands, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, we just uh, want to remind uh, folks on decorum, especially talking about leadership or how other people are uh, uh, operating in that way. And I can only name, and I'm only naming leadership, including us and those who have been part of policy creation. This is not saying any negative things about them. I'm saying I'm very disheartened by the confusion that we've experienced for the past three weeks that has been completely unnecessary, that has been murkering our, our authority. And that's not appropriate, I think, in this current climate where the legislative body is the closest decision-making body to the public. And I want our public to trust and know that we're here to carry out their interests. And I would hope also that our staff and all leadership that has a place in the city, I would hope that or thought that we were all on the same page. And the Hennepin project was a key aspect of how are we really moving towards a different future for our city. And it was very sad, saddening to see that we still are not on the same page. And I would hope that this project is a reminder for us to figure out how we can get back on the same page of actually making the city a more equitable place for all of our residents, whether you take transit, whether you are a renter, whether you are a student, and transportation is such a key part of that, and such a key part of this project that will set the terms and conditions for how these other projects that's gonna to come to my ward, every single one of our wards. So I do wanna put that on public record and note that as all of us who were elected here and some of us who were appointed here, that is our collective charge. And I will hope and I encourage us to take that very seriously. Thank you, Councilmember Wansley. And, you know, just for the why, I know these are oftentimes very uh, big issues, right? And they have real outcomes and affect people. And whether that's uh, transit users, whether that's uh, folks who don't use transit, whether that's small businesses. And these are really challenging uh, issues that we work through. And I know that. Uh, I feel very fortunate to get to work with so many smart, dedicated people that care deeply about our city. And we can have a lot of smart, dedicated people all looking at the same data, the same issues, and we can come to different conclusions on it. And I just want to really remind us of that and, uh, and really lean into the fact that we have these processes to try to sort that out. And it is important to have uh, differences of opinion to be able to talk about these concerns and these issues as well. And it, it's okay too when we are on different uh, pages when it comes to votes or issues. And we're just gonna work through it all and keep working for the people of Minneapolis uh, as we're all committed to do. So thank you and uh, not seeing any further business before this committee without objection, we stand adjourned. Thanks everyone.